Hey everybody, Dr. Daniel Fabricant here, NPA CEO and President. I'm really lucky for uh, this executive series to be joined by Steve Rosenman. Steve is one of the founding executives of IBC, uh, who everybody knows. Uh, Steve, if there's a financial transaction that's happened with IBC in the in the recent future, past 10 years, uh, Steve's had his fingerprints over. He understands the industry and how the industry grows better than anybody. Um, and, you know, consistent with all the folks on our board has been a real leader there. So, Steve, I'm really glad to have you here today and got a few questions for you that I think people want to know and know more about you. So thank you for doing this. Sure. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Uh, IVC has grown tremendously over the past decade, uh, more than 10x in 10 years as one of the founding executives. Um, what's the secret sauce, Steve? How did it begin? You know, uh, I people want to hear that. It's, it's been a fun ride for sure. It's been uh, a little over 13 years now. IBC started with a concept uh, from our CEO a while back that uh, needed to produce uh, supplement products, dietary supplements that are accessible by as many people as possible. So naturally you think about the mass market and you also think about things like store brands. Cause store brands have been increasing in popularity and loyalty for years and years. But the original thesis was there really was no store brand manufacturers out there. Lots of contract manufacturers, lots of brands, uh, some branded, really large branded companies that also do contract manufacturing for product, but no one who just focused on bridal label. That's where this whole idea came from. They really specialize in that uh, kind of not compete with customers and just be that, that driver for, for the, uh, the retail brands, stores. So that's where this all came about. Um, it's been, a, it's been a great evolution because initially it was all about manufacturing properly, manufacturing um, quality, but efficiency. That way we got the price to where it needed to be to break into the market. Originally, uh, IBC started from a company that was really um, not doing very well at the time. It was really struggling to compete. So when we made the manufacturing efficient and also got closer to raw materials, I know we'll probably talk about raw materials in this discussion, it helped everything. It helped kind of tighten everything up and, and get the quality going, the control going, and, and brought some pricing down where we could compete. That really helped us break in. That was kind of the first level of growth. Uh, the second was then you're let, you need a layer of value on top of that once you get in. Create margin. That way everyone's happy. That was all done through innovation. So that's, that's a big part of this growth story for years and years, kind of getting from that 200 million to three, 400 million, a lot of new product introduction, where um, we almost had to act, we're actually outperform brands. And that's kind of how I think about things, is you have to really know the consumer. A lot of people think, okay, well, it's a contract manufacturer, you just gotta make the product, that's it. That's fine, but you'll be competing with hundreds if not thousands of others out there. You really need to know the consumer and what they're thinking, what they're wanting, and then solve for that, like a brand. So, you know, that's kind of how I've run things there, um, product innovation, even company innovation. And, you know, the, the rest of the story, you know, the story kind of flies. So we, we, did, we did well and got to that half billion dollar level or just under that. That's where acquisitions, the third thing really came into play. Um, most of, if not all, actually all of our acquisitions, um, that I targeted have all been strategic. It was either to get us into a delivery form, it was to uh, maybe take out a competitor, or and by doing so, it's not just taking out a competitor, it's helping a retailer because Probably better their, service. Their, their brand, their portfolio, right. Yeah, and create a brand effectively, right, as you talked about, beating, beating a brand with, uh, yeah, a store brand. That's right. Yes. And we've also done some really cool ones where um, we acquire manufacturing technologies. Um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's, those are, uh, that kind of set the company up over the past uh, decade to, for just continued growth. It's been, been a lot of fun. People don't think of a manufacturer of food drug mass or a club or a store brand, if you will, as innovative. So clearly you kind of flipped that on its head. What were, uh, what were some of the, the keys there? What were some of your, you know, people always use KPIs as a term. I can't stand that term because it sounds <laughs> But what were your, you know, what what told you that you were on the right path on that? Because clearly that's what you guys did. Yeah, for sure. You know, I would say there's you got there's two 
key things uh, that come to my mind with the innovation that we've delivered to the market. One is really knowing, going back to knowing the consumer. Um, you have to know them. You have to almost uh, stay ahead of their thinking and see what's coming. And it brings me to the second point. They're very interrelated. So you, you need the consumer trends. You actually need the, the market trends too. And that's more than just the dollars of what's moving. It's, it's way beyond that. It's actually getting involved in the community, knowing the ingredients, the other manufacturers. MPA is a good example of this where there's such a good network with, within MPA, within the membership. I mean, you could talk to somebody who is a small retail store owner in the natural product space, or you can talk to somebody uh, like a DuPont or, or a really large company, BASF. So when you're networked in there and you take the consumer and then try to find solutions with all these other companies that play in the space, that's when innovation really starts. And you know, for 13, I just give you example after example how we've done ingredient innovation, manufacturing technology innovation, um, we've worked with brands. Uh, we've worked with Nickelodeon to license stuff on, on, on products. So it's, it gets fun, um, but you have to be, you really have to be out there. It's nothing like you just mentioned. KPIs are good. You have to do it to run the manufacturing and to run a, run a tight, tight ship, but you're not going to, this stuff's not going to be uncovered in KPIs. Got it. So ingredients, big part of innovation. How yeah. does People don't necessarily look for, you know, food drug mass club manufacturer to say, hey, we're going to the brand because it's going to cost you more. How, how did how did you how did you make that happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a great it's a great question, because um, even on the brand side, brands in this space always go for low price products. I mean, they, they obviously want the marketing advantage, but this is a very commodity price sensitive space of what we play in the dietary supplements, whether you're brand or private label. Um, but I'm not a commodity guy. I've, I've never been, um, <laughs> whether it be an ingredient, a manufacturing uh, facility, I'm for a more sustained long-term value. And on the ingredient side, I think what it takes to get that value across and be able to ask the consumer to pay more for it is you really need to differentiate and properly communicate it. You need to um, execute where you're, you're delivering that value. And I'll give you an example. It's one where it's an MPA member. Um, they've no uh, recently. No names. That, no names. I, I won't we'll do a name, but they recently had a good uh, financial transaction. So they've been doing really well. And I think the reason they do is because they, they offered a carotenoid type product with added value. Um, not only was their, um, their processing technology allowing for a cost-effective um, market entry of this carotenoid, but actually had incremental claims versus a regular carotenoid, things that like could improve eyesight or um, help promote eyesight, um, things that others couldn't say, this ingredient could say. And so what you do is you go to those types of ingredients and you make sure that that incremental benefit is communicated to the customer. And you'd be surprised. And obviously, brands do that all day long. That's, that's what they're always looking for and searching for. But the store brands, uh, any data that you look at shows that with more information able to be found online with all the transparency that a consumer can find, store brands are really growing. And um, those types of products can now play in that space because the uh, you know digitally, you can just go in and find out more about these types of things. So... Oh, I mean, you guys have certainly been, you know, you've definitely shifted the paradigm in terms of brand ingredients and, you know, and, and innovation on that level. Uh, but also big, big proponents of, of our organization, of SSCI, big involvement in SSCI and getting our quality from the center. You know, you hear folks in kind of two, you know, two sides of their mouth. They go, well, you can't market on quality at the same time. You have to market on quality. So how do you balance those two, and, you know, does the, is the organization helpful in that regard? Like, what is it that you guys really look for? Because you guys are well known as, as a sure. top in terms of quality. Well, you know, so you mentioned balance quality. And for us, that's that's almost not an option. It's, it's really not a balance. It's almost a foundation of quality because we deal with so many customers, um, and these are these are large scale customers that really have no appetite for risk at all on their shelves. Um, no appetite for risk of the product being off the shelf, or if it's on the shelf, something wrong with the product. So that can't happen. 
So we ensure that the manufacturing foundation, the people that we have involved um, are based in quality. And now when I was referring back to 13 years when we started, the company wasn't doing well all financial. Much smaller company, didn't have the manufacturing efficiency, but what the company did have, it was always known for quality. It's one of the reasons I came to the company because when I saw the time, they had no 483s. And, you know, that was the big, that was the big promotion yeah. of, of what you was IBC back then. Hey, go to these guys, they've got a 483. <laughs> right. yeah. and we've all seen that market, right? And they had the, uh, they had an OTC facility and an RX drug software. So they had, um, they almost operated this dietary supplement facility to RX standards because RX was within the network. So we had to. And so it, it actually started with quality and we kind of built from there. Um, you know, then we had the idea of getting manufacturing efficiency from our CEO, Stephen Dye. Um, and then we, we had the innovation, the M&A and all the business development that just pile on top of that. You know, quality is essential, which is why really years ago when we joined MPA, uh, we did it for several reasons. Uh, but quality was a big one. And we've had uh, staff members at IBC get involved. Um, it's great to know that there's always someone uh, in Washington, uh, either in the office or on the Hill, thinking about these things, reaching out to um, the people that matter to try to push quality you know, in our industry. It's very important. Got to, we have to tell the quality story. Um, well, I mean, you took some calculated risks, but clearly it wasn't. They weren't uh, unknown. You know the, you know the consumer you know the industry, Steve. Where do things go from here? Obviously, coming out of the pandemic, everything is, you know, vitamin D, zinc, elderberry, <laughs> vitamin C all the time. But there's going to be some shift on that. So so where do we go in a year? Where do we go in three years? Where do we go in five years, ten years? What do you see? That's a, that's a great question. And there's a lot going on. So there's a lot on my mind. Um, so the COVID impact was significant, as everybody knows, watching this, listening to this. Uh, we really saw a spike last March, about mid-March. And even since, it's really sustained. Almost where our compound annual growth rate for the industry, I think everyone would would uh, admit it's, a, it's almost double where it should be. I believe it will. I believe it is sustainable. Um, not these levels. You're not going to get 20% keggers, but uh, normally our industry is 5%, 5.5%. Uh, I actually think 8 to 12, the next several years is realistic. So I think it's going to be a fun space for quite some time. And, and why is that? Well, when people uh, were impacted by this pandemic, they started new regiments. Now, at first, you had people freaking out <laughs> and uh, they, they pantry loaded and started taking new things. But as they eased into this, they understand these are natural products. It's, they're, they're, they don't come with the side effects of other things. Um, they provide solutions and, and just alternate options. And it, they're, Whatever you're talking about, whether it's elderberry or whether it's vitamin C or vitamin D or emerging types of herbs, um, it offers options for people to add, easily manage their own health and put into their regimen. And the government has been promoting self-help for a while versus spending a lot of money on treatment. So I think that will continue to fuel things. Um, where we go, there's a lot going on. There's, um, you know, the, the online sales channel, digital marketing is not stopping. Uh, and that's, there's pros and cons to that. You know, a lot of people I, I know out there, um, there's a lot of really good players that have great products and they just use the digital space as a means to market them. Then there's guys and some of my friends, uh, you know, guys and gals that I talk to, I say, how do you guys do this? It's almost overnight your success. And, you know, I didn't even know you guys were into this space. So we're not, we're, we're marketers. <laughs> So, you know, they, they search on what people are looking for and develop the product backwards. So, which is okay too, but as long as the product is a good product and it's quality and all that. But, so I think there's a lot of that going on, um, which I, I believe um, brings me to the ingredient part. When that goes on, you always need a, a selling proposition, something you need. And I think that's going to fuel a lot of emerging ingredients. Um, I see adaptogens, I see, I see Indian and, and potentially Chinese, but especially Indian, natural, traditional uh, herbal medicine, um, things like CBD, if that uh, moves on the regulatory front, I think a lot of companies are locked and loaded with it. It's just how fast do they go and where do they go with it? Um, on the manufacturing side, I, I see consolidation. 
I think we saw a brand consolidation over the past few years. Um, IBC has consolidated a lot of the contract, the larger contract manufacturers. Uh, I see, I can see IBC calming down in that area and others stepping up and doing more um, unique and specialized manufacturing. Okay. Smaller runs, more boutique-ish, if you will, type things. And especially, so. with, yeah. and especially with so many, like you said, so many just with an internet presence right away, they want to have a special formulation. I would imagine saying, okay, our formulation is going to be unique and we're going to market, market it. So. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of those guys, yeah, because traditionally, like a company like IBC, our manufacturing uh, efficiency is on, built on volume, scale, and technology. And so when you ask, well, what about these little guys? They don't, none of them have any technology. Well, it's not true. Their advantage may not be technology. It may be that they're just so great at moving fast and serving these upcoming brands where a bigger player can't do it. So to me, that's differentiation. Too. No, that's, that's important too. And that's, you know, I mean, obviously, NPA, huge fans of IBC, huge fans of you though. Where do you see, I mean, you know, you're talking about a business model doesn't necessarily... I don't know, fit into IBC's business models the same, but certainly there's a bridge there. Um, you know, where, you know, with, with ideas like that, Steve, what, you know, what do you want to change in the industry, do different in the industry in the future? What's your, sure. you know, sure. driving you? Um, well, I, I can certainly see IBC getting into some of that and diversifying a bit. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a big ship, but if they go that route, I think there could be some really nice growth there. Um, yeah, but for me personally, because it's been it's been a long time uh, with IBC. I look back; I didn't even know I was there 13 years the other day. I looked at dates. I'm like, holy crap! I mean, wow, so look at the, right. time goes by, right? But um, I mean, for for me personally, it's probably uh, a a dual path uh, at the same time. I've been I've been working on things for a long time, um, building some of my own investments within the industry. I'll probably continue with those. Uh, they're more in the branded space. Uh, very ingredient focused and um, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about in the future. One of them has a charitable component to it, which, oh, wow. cur yeah, which currently does not exist in the industry. So that's, that's one that is just close to me personally. Uh, the other path is, is likely going to be trying to help um, like a number three player, try to get to number two or one. And, and uh, I, I like growth companies. So I'm always into the probably smaller to middle market size companies trying to, help them get larger versus just being comfortable at a larger company. It's, that's, that's where I see myself in the future getting involved in. You know, given the background in IBC, anytime you and I have been together in a function with other people in the industry, as soon as they find out you're from IBC, they run to you because they want, they want to do business with IBC. <laughs> that's question number one you get. But question number two you get, because people understand that you know the consumer, you know the industry, they always go, Steve, what's going to happen with CBD or with X ingredient? So, Steve, what's going to happen with CBD or X ingredient? CBD. So, I can tell you that, you know, I know there's been what I'll call pent up demand. You can look at any of the, you know, you could, you could look at the supply, the oversupply out there in the, the CBD commodity market, um, the raw material market anyway. I, I see it, and I have been skeptical in the past, especially, and I think anybody can be, because for years it's almost been like a stalemate. I'm really bullish on it, and here's the reason why. Not so much from my own perspective. I, I, I need, for me, see more science first. However, my ears and eyes to the market are, are telling me that consumers and these big retailers want it. Okay. They're, just, they're, just, they're either waiting where they're kind of dabbling. And if they're dabbling, it's usually with brands. It's usually it's less risky to go with a brand than your own stuff when, when there's things in flux. But I'm telling you, they're waiting. So I think the, the position I would take to talking to any company out there that isn't already in it or, or trying to just do the right thing by how, you know, how regulations are and everything right now is I'd be ready for it. I'd be ready to go from day one. Okay, ready to go. So now there's a, there's a concept that, you know, IBC, that means one thing. The internet marketers, that means another. It does, yeah. What does it, I mean, what does it mean, especially not just for CBD, but we're looking at so many, you know, I was on a webinar the other day with FTC, and obviously they're very in tune right now to immune claims because immune is up, you know, 20, yeah. 30 percent in products. So, so what does somebody do to differentiate themselves? What is, what is that? 
what does that look like? And it's not a one size fits all answer, but how, how do you striate that if you're going to stand out in the crowd? It's a, it's a great question, especially when there's not the guidance that I think the industry is looking for. For you, know, you, you throw 10 formulators in a room without guidance, and they're all going to come up with different levels. <laughs> so, you know, and, and they're all going to be differentiated, but can you market it? And you know, your comment before was, was very astute in that there's brands out there, when I, when I say to be ready, they're already they're marketing and stuff. You <laughs> think you go to Natural Products Expo, they're and ready. it's CBD's out there, right? But yeah, for, the, for, for, a, for a company... Um, that has a large brand or a contract manufacturer or store brand, being ready means have the products ready to go, do all the due diligence, the product, sub sign the substantiation. How do you differentiate? Let, let's assume everybody kind of knows, okay, here's the levels we got to play in. Here's the hemp-based CBD product that we're talking about. You know, my gut goes to delivery forms. Um, traditionally, this stuff came like hemp oil with soft gels. Uh, everybody that I know, all the big suppliers are, hey, you got you manufacturers, got to go soft gels, got to go soft gels. Um, I think that's crazy. I think you got to go the other way. <laughs> um, and I, I see, you know, I see things like edibles being and gummies being a driver to differentiate versus your typical. Either today you get a soft gel, a capsule, or some sort of drink, and. There's pros and cons to all of it, but you know the differentiation I think comes with with innovation. Um, so it's going to be packaging, it's going to be uh, delivery form. I think that's that's probably going to be what it is. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, gummies, you know, gummies never seem to go out of style. You know, I've got two small kids, I you do as well. So like, there's you're always, I'm always like, why am I still buying gummies? Because they're always going to eat gummies. People are always going to eat gummies. Yeah. So yeah, it's a huge part of it. Um, where you know. In terms of, and you know the M&A side as well as anybody, you know, we've heard for so long, especially with the past year, I think there was a lot of M&A money, whether it's angel investor, VC, private equity, yeah. on the sidelines. But people saying there's so much there. What are they looking in terms of value for companies, whether it's whether it's a contract manufacturer or brand? Uh, you know, it's a question we get off, and I know you get it a lot too, is, hey, how do I – you know, for lack of a, you know, I'm not as sophisticated finance wise as you are, but how do you make yourself pretty for that open market, for that M&A market? What, what do firms need to look at? What do people need to do? Um, yeah, very interesting. So uh, the, the market is, I, I don't know if, well, I guess it's inflated. I was going to say, I'm not going to call it inflated, but it, it's, it's, it's high. So people are getting a lot of valuation out there. Um, and, you know, you have different players out there. So the VCs are really my experience uh, recent, more recently is they're really going for brands. They're going for smaller brands that have a uh, very good chance of getting a high growth trajectory pretty quickly. Um, and that's typical of VC, but that's, I think they're more for brands and looking for those marketers out there, the ones that can churn stuff really quickly. We're lucky in our industry that uh, there are some consumer health uh, private equity companies that in my view are, are really best ones for the industry because they take a lasting and sustainable growth view to some companies out there. And by the way, IBC is technically from private equity, you know, and um, it's private investors. So um, that model is interesting because uh, vested healthcare private equity, they come in and really help build. And they build things like that. They build quality systems. They build efficient manufacturing and new technologies, which leads to differentiation. So they may flip it to something else. But over that period of time, it's hard to get that growth to, from a small to middle-sized company without that in our industry. And Dan, I know you know in your network, they're, they, they're lurking out there. And I think it's, it's a good thing that they're there. Um, you yeah, know, right now... Isn't it, Steve? I mean, it's so fit driven. I mean, that's an interesting thing about IBC and your relationship with IBC is you guys have so many different fits with these groups. With these groups. I don't know that many private equities have that sort of yeah, you know, that sort of integration. Maybe I'm wrong. This one's this one is a little different because it's a real long term hold, obviously, and very different investors uh, than typical. You know, some private equities flip every three to five years. Um, there's a few, probably I can count them on my hand, uh, that take very long-term approaches in, in our space that I'd argue have grown probably the biggest manufacturing capabilities in our space. Uh, you know, in a gummy company, a probiotic company, I can see these are all out of that kind of 
uh, middle market, uh, private equity that take invested approach versus just here's the money, let's flip it. Uh, it doesn't happen in all industries. We're rather lucky because the natural product space and uh, dietary supplements, they, there are healthcare players that take vested um, uh, positions in these companies. And I think the, the results are great because consumers benefit from it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the financial markets is, they've been up and so valuations are up. And uh, I, I know that for the venture money, I mean, Dan, you and I could probably develop something on this comments call and get money by the time it's done. So you gotta be careful out there. But. I could carry away. I don't know if you could. I mean, I'm not, don't, don't put that, don't put that on. No, but I, I think that that's an interesting point is there's, like you said, people are very bullish on the industry, rightfully so. Right now, people want to stay healthy. Doctor visits are down, you know, 70%. While well, there's telemedicine and some other options, it's, it's only a fraction of where we were before. And like you said, self care is there. So, I mean, that's been that's been the driver. Um, how do you, you know, so that's that's like, you know, that's the first step for brands that want to grow. What's what's the next step? How do they go? Okay, self-care, yeah, there's motivation for self-care. How do we either really continue to tap into that? Because at some point, you know, like you said, you know, are we going to stay as bullish as we are right now with the pandemic? Probably not, but some firms are. Why? Why are some firms going to stay that bullish and other firms aren't? What, what can they do? Yeah. You know, you grew IBC, you know, you're part of the executive team at IBC, you grew that 10x in 10 years. I, I think you get that question a lot. So, um, you know, I'm curious as to how do, you, how, do you, how do you hold on to that, you know, to that fire, if you will. Mm -hmm. You need to know where to play. So in this environment, what I would say is uh, when we talk about the COVID impact, there's been a lot of people that have come in and been introduced to things in our space that maybe they weren't here before, and they started a regiment. I think they're going to continue that regimen. So you keep them probably, you know, by focusing on immune and, and protective type of ingredients, but also a good delivery. They have to prefer to take something. So, you know, those unique delivery forms coming up. I mean, that's how you are sticky to a customer and you stay with them and, uh, and they become loyal. Um, you follow them throughout a health journey. So we talked about, you, you just mentioned um, telehealth. Well, I think that's a huge part of this because telehealth, concierge medicine, and personalized uh, medicine and personalized nutrition, this is all going to tie together in the future. These people are living their lives. Um, millennials are, are not baby boomers. They buy completely differently. <laughs> you know, we both kind of chuckle about that, but you know, I can't chuckle anymore because now the, the millennials are actually getting jobs and they, they're making money. So, <laughs> Well, you so, and I are that generation between. No one studies our body patterns. <laughs> I feel on water now, but you want to study my body, but yes, you know, I will tell you though, the, with, you know, with this, with the spending and the size of the millennial uh, generation, because it's really the, the, the next largest from the baby boomers. Now we have to really start paying attention. And the, the biggest thing that you need to know about that group, and this hopefully will help answer your question of what do you get into and how do you do it in the future to keep growing? They're not looking for prevention. Okay. Right. They're looking for results. Right. So these internet brands, you would just ask, you know, how do you spit, how do these brands keep growing from maybe a one-off thing to something bigger? If you're if you're gonna promise someone that you're gonna try to manage their stress and you put it out there in social media and with digital marketing, it, it better make you feel better and manage your stress. Because otherwise, guess what? You're moving on to the very next thing that says it's gonna manage stress. Right. Um, and so you know, so there's some really good examples in the industry creative thinking companies that launched a brand that probably they didn't know whether they were going to be successful. They didn't even know they wanted to be a dietary supplement, but now there's a lot of them out there that have some thinking to do. Are they going to be this one-off kind of up and down type of thing or, or will they build themselves into companies that are sustainable health consumer health companies? And that's, you know, no, that's, I mean, you nailed it. I love you know, no, no one says stickiness anymore. And I appreciate you saying that because that really is the key here is, uh, you know, how do we, and it's funny as an industry too, we have at least 70% of the country uses supplements based on whatever survey you look at, it's between 75 okay. and 65. But you're right. I mean, the buying pattern is changing. It's not about prevention anymore. It's really, you know, you make a great point about people want that real time data. So, you know, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. At what point do, you know, 
at what point do we have wearables that are monitoring your, you know, your vitamin D levels and everything else? I mean, how, how much of that is going to shape the next five, 10 years? And, and yeah. you know, where do folks need to be on those sorts of ideas? So that, you know, that is the, let's call it the trillion dollar question, because I think if you ask any, I think any health company, whether it's RX, OTC, nutritional device, everyone's thinking the same thing. And it's because it started many years ago when scientists were studying microbiome and they developed the concept of personalized medicine. Forgetting nutrition, it started with medicine. It's, and we're not even near where we need to be with personalized medicine. It's just on the forefront, as, as you know. So this whole personalized nutrition, when we say we're early, it's like, you know, it, it's like dinosaur ages here. We're, we're really, really early. And to answer your question, so there's devices already. There's all different things. If you want to know what type of supplement to take, you could either, you could answer a survey, you take a blood test, you could take a stool sample, um, you do um, uh, saliva test. There's a lot, a lot of diagnostics, okay? My question to, to the people that are really experts in the space, the people, and by that I mean people who put their money up to try to get in the space, I ask them all the time, is there one technology, one device that's running away with it right now that, I, that we should invest in? And they look, you know, after a few seconds of looking deep in the space, they say, no. Right. And so I ask them the same question. I said to the experts that have been doing this longer than I have, I say, so the next three, five years, do you see one scientific uh, diagnostic or technology that's going to run, run away with it. Nobody's been able to answer them yet. They all say no. So that tells me, not only are we early, but I'd be very hesitant to invest heavily in one diagnostic because, you know, you do, let's say you commit to blood test uh, today. Well, tomorrow someone may come up with something new that reads uh, retina in your eye and you're done. So I think it's, it's going to take some more time. Um, and I think that's evident by the companies that are involved. They don't think there's, there's not many making money yet, but it's something that like CBD, you have to be ready. Right. And so for me, being ready is knowing the consumer, um, what's their, what's their pain and pressure points on what they'd spend. How, how do they want to get into this? Are they going to take a blood test or do they just want to serve it? You know, it's, it's, you gotta really learn those things first. Um, but I think there's companies doing it now and, Yes. Do I see a wearable technology managing health and nutrition in the future? And I would say absolutely, I do. It's not going to be next year, but I do see that in the future. Well, Steve, this is incredible. I can't thank you enough. We, we're going to have to do this again because I think there's so many good insights, especially, you know, there's right now, um, you know, I have to tell you, there's so many folks who want to invest in the industry, get involved. And, and there's so many, you know, uh, there's so many insights you have that are just really tremendous on that. So I can't thank you enough for this. Um, Thanks, Dan. Any parting shots, anything I, I should have asked you and was, you know, just not smart enough to ask? <laughs> I don't know. You're a pretty smart guy. So, no, I, I enjoyed doing this. I, I hope uh, anyone who listens gets a lot out of it. Really appreciate everything. Yeah, the next one. Yeah. No, and Steve, really appreciate everything you, IBC, does for the organization, does for the industry. Um, you know, it's tremendous. Can't thank you enough. So, uh, look forward to, to doing another one with you soon. You know, Another one of these with you soon. Um, hopefully, the Eagles have you know their head coaching staff and the rest in place by then for the next time. But, you know. Yeah, our sports situation is uh, that's the one thing if I could ask you know <laughs> improve Philly sports, but it's, it's been rough for us. And I yeah, these guys, but you know, hey, all good. But Steve, thanks again. Really appreciate it, and uh, we'll be posting this soon on www.npanational.org. Um, so definitely check it out. Um, and again, Steve, can't thank you enough.